Greetings, this is Brian, and we are in week 12 of the Physics 122 semester, which is crazy, so that means it's time to get ready for our test, which is going to be coming up on April 17th, as I'm sure everybody is aware. And so this week we're going to do some applications, and we're going to do that by way of reviewing some pieces that we've seen previously. And the other thing we're going to do is just some straight up review. We're going to be reviewing things for the test, which is coming up. And we're going to start with this picture right here. This picture is a bone scan. It looks like it's an x-ray. But you can see it's not showing where the bones are. It's showing some particular patches of activity in the bones. And this is a, an image. It's a bone scan with someone who has some pretty severe um, rheumatoid arthritis. And we're going to talk about how you would make such an image and what differentiates it from an x-ray um, going forward. But before we do that, I want to talk about the big picture. And, and first off, I want to talk about the big picture of your lives. I know your lives are difficult and complicated now. Um, I miss seeing you folks. Um, I really do. Um, I really enjoyed our classroom culture. And transitioning to an online classroom culture has been a bit of a, uh, it's been a process of adaptation for me. I hope it's going well for you. And I think about you folks often, and I hope that you're well. And it's a pleasure to be able to continue as your instructor, even in these difficult times. But as you're thinking about getting ready for the test, I'm going to encourage you to do one big thing. Think concepts first, think equations second. And I think you folks have a tendency to just want to jump for an equation and say, ooh, I'm going to use this equation to solve the problem. And what you want to do first is think about what are the concepts, what is happening physically, and then the equation should practically suggest itself. As you're thinking back, to all the things which we've studied, I would encourage you to go into the textbook and take a look at the part summaries. And the part summaries are summaries of parts of the textbook. It's a summary of everything we've seen over the past several weeks. Okay, and so for instance, if you look at the part six summary, it's a summary of everything in electricity and magnetism. And it's a really compact way to get a look at what are the big picture? What is the big picture? And then in the succeeding pages, there are some um, integrated kind of problems you can do that are integrated across the part. So I would encourage you to take a look at those things. Now we're going to do a bit of exam review and we're going to do it by looking at this process right here. I'm going to ask you to spot the physics. So look at a physical situation and tell me what's happening and how can you apply physics to this. And this is the approach that I want you to be thinking about. I want you to be thinking about concepts first. What is happening physically? And once I figure out what's happening physically, think about the equations that we could apply. Okay, so here's something to be aware of. We talked about um, in the chapter, and we talked about in class a little bit, about how you could measure the age of something by using carbon-14. And the way you um, one of the things you were told is that the fraction of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is this. It's 1.3 times 10 to the negative 12. That's the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio, and that's fairly constant. What that means is since carbon-14 is continuously decaying, it also has to be made at a steady rate, and it's made by cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are these high-energy particles that strike the Earth's atmosphere at very, very high speeds, and they come from literally the cosmos, like we're not 100% sure where they come from, but they're striking the Earth's upper atmosphere. They make different things. Nitrogen is the most abundant gas in our atmosphere. If a high-energy neutron slams into an atom, a, a nucleus of nitrogen-14, what it does is this. A neutron comes in and pops out a proton. A neutron and proton have about the same mass, so that's very easy to imagine happening. It comes in, transfers all of its energy to a proton. Proton pops out, and then the nucleus has transformed into one that has one more proton and one fewer neutron. So the atomic number goes down by one. The atomic weight stays exactly the same. So we end up with not nitrogen-14, but carbon-14. And this is happening at a steady rate, and it's happening at approximately the same rate as the carbon-14 is decaying at. And so the fraction of carbon-14 in the environment is constant. And so anything that's living and exchanging carbon with the environment has about the same amount of carbon-14 in it. But once 
things die, once they stop exchanging carbon with the environment, the clock starts ticking. Now I want you to think about how we just discussed how carbon-14 was made in the upper atmosphere. And I want you to answer this. What is the most likely decay mode? And I don't want you to look it up. I don't want you to go to the textbook and see what the likely decay mode is. I want you to think, I want you to reason based on physics. What is the most likely decay mode of carbon-14? And I want you to explain. Take a minute, think about that. I'll be here when you get back. We know how they decay. We know how they decay. So remember how we made the carbon-14. What we did is we took a nucleus of nitrogen-14, which is stable. We stuck in an extra neutron and we popped out a proton. So as a consequence, you end up with this nucleus that clearly is going to be neutron-rich. This nucleus has too many neutrons for its comfort. And we know how nuclei which have too many neutrons decay. The easiest thing for them to do is to take a neutron, turn it into a proton, and when it does that, it emits a high energy negatively charged particle. It emits a beta minus particle. So this is tailor-made for beta minus decay, and that is in fact how carbon-14 decays. It's a beta minus decay, you know that's true. But I, when you were thinking about this problem, I want you to just reason about it. Don't go and look it up. You know enough to be able to say this now based on everything we've done because we're focusing on the concepts. Now here's a question for you. So suppose an archeologist of the future unearthed this tie-dyed t-shirt from the 1960s. And if they do carbon-14 dating on it, I want you to think about everything that we've talked about. Will they overestimate or will they underestimate the age? Now think about how that relates to everything we talked about on our last topic in nuclear physics. We did that duck and cover, Tales of the Atomic Age. Think about that. Think about all the things we talked about that day. And then ask yourself this. Will they overestimate or underestimate the age? age? Reason about this. Don't look it up. Remind yourself of the details that we talked about last Friday. What's your verdict on that? Take a minute to think about it. I'll be here when you get back. What we talked about during that duck and cover Tales of the Atomic Age class, the fact that atmospheric carbon-14 increased dramatically because of above ground nuclear testing. And if you look at this, this is the fraction of carbon-14 in the environment relative to some baseline. So if the baseline is 100, you can see in the 1950s when we started to have above ground nuclear testing, there was a great increase in the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. And at the date of passing the Partial Test Ban Treaty, which is what PTBT stands for, in October of 1963, that limited the above-ground nuclear tests. Until that time, there was a great increase of carbon-14 in the atmosphere until it was almost double what it was previously. So as a consequence, even up until the present, you can see there's a little bit of extra carbon-14 in the environment than should be present naturally. So if you had something which was uh, made in the 1960s, during the 1960s, if you look at this whole era here, this whole era is 1960s, there's way more carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So as a consequence, anything that was created in that era has way more carbon-14 in it than you would predict. And as a consequence, what does that lead you to think about the age? Take another minute to think about that. I'll be here when you get back. Okay, so this thing has too much carbon-14 in it. And so as time goes on, when it's measured in the future, if you just assume that when it was made, it had the same amount of carbon-14 as it's been historically true, it's gonna have more than that. And that will lead you to think it's younger than it was because as time goes on, the amount of carbon-14 decreases and this has got extra carbon-14 and so you're going to underestimate. You're going to underestimate the age. And in the future, when people dig up things, they're going to have to correct for that. 
because their ages otherwise will be underestimates. Now, I want you to think about this question. Oil and coal generally contain no measurable carbon-14. So if you look at the carbon-14 in oil and coal, there is basically none. What does that tell you about how long the oil and coal have been buried? I want you to think about that. And I don't want I want you to think about that. I don't want you to look it up. I don't want you to do a Google search. I want you to reason based on what you've learned in this course. What does this tell us about how long the oil and coal have been buried? Go ahead and talk. Go ahead and think about it for a minute. I'll be here when you get back. Well, if there's no measurable carbon-14, that means basically all the carbon-14 has decayed, and that means they have been buried a long time long time. No measurable carbon-14 means they've been bur buried more than like 100,000 years, and that's enough half-lives that um, you're not going to be able to detect anything that's there. So oil and coal have been underground for a long, long time. We know that that's true. Because they're produced from plants, we know that. So it, when they were made, um, when the plants were, were growing, there was a lot of carbon-14, but then they've gotten buried. That's why they're called fossil fuels. They've been down there for a long time. They've been buried. They've been changing their chemical form. Now there's no carbon-14. They've been down there a long time. Now here's a really interesting thing that somebody in the class told me about, which is kind of awesome. When you by drinking alcohol in the United States, and I've illustrated this by having some bottles of wine here with labels on them. They test it to see if it's radioactive, and it must register at least 400 becquerels per 750 milliliters of alcohol. Now, why is that true? Why would you require alcohol to be radioactive? That seems like a very, very, very odd notion indeed. But I want you to think about the source of the alcohol. Where does the alcohol come from and where can it not come from? And it's related to the topic we just considered. Think about that one. Take a moment. I'll be here when you get back. Here's the crux of the biscuit. Okay, the alcohol in drinking alcohol has to come from plant sources, not from fossil fuels. You can take, you can take petroleum products and you can make uh, ethyl alcohol from it, but you can't do that and sell it as drinking alcohol in this country. You can use that for like industrial alcohol, that's perfectly fine, but if for drinking alcohol in this country, it must come from plant sources. And because it comes from plant sources, the carbon in that ethanol must contain a certain fraction of carbon-14. And so drinking alcohol, by law, is required to have a certain activity, which is kind of awesome. Now I want to talk about nuclear medicine and I want to think about this as applications of all the nuclear stuff that we've been thinking about. And here's something to be aware of. The effects of radiation on tissues in the body depend upon um, basically how rapidly dividing are the tissues. Rapidly dividing tissue is the most susceptible. So tumors, extremely susceptible to radiation because that's tumors thing, is like really rapid cell division. Bone marrow, very susceptible. Lighting of the digestive tract, very susceptible. Hair follicles, your hair is always growing, very susceptible. Your brain is not very susceptible because you're not having a lot of cell division there. I mean, you know this, you know this, there's not a lot of growth in, in, the, in the number of neurons that you have. So damaging bone marrow takes two sieverts, damaging the brain takes 50 sieverts, and that's just because there's a lot less cell division. Now, radiation can cure cancer, absolutely true, and that was discovered not long after um, radioactivity was discovered, the radiation could, could cure cancer. And that the reason is because tumors are extremely susceptible to radiation. But also radiation on healthy tissue can produce mutations that can cause cancer. So it's a double-edged sword. Here's one way that you can use uh, radiation to treat cancers. And actually this woman here is being treated for brain cancer and um, she's having this gamma knife treatment. So she has this little collimator um, over her head and there's little holes in here where radiation can go through but only in certain directions and this was tailor-made it was fitted to her so when the radiation goes through and um, they're using gamma rays so her basically 
she and this helmet that she's wearing and everything is slid into this region where there's a radioactive source and the radiation can only go through in certain directions and the idea is the radiation is going to pass through the brain in a way so that every ray that comes through passes through the tumor so you get a large dose to the tumor and much less to the healthy tissue and the gamma rays are produced in the decay of cobalt 60 and cobalt 60 decays to nickel but it's an excited form of nickel and the excited form of nickel subsequently decays with the emission of two gamma rays basically when the cobalt decays into nickel the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus aren't in their lowest energy state. They're in higher energy states, and so they drop into lower energy states. And as they do that, they emit photons. But since the nuclear energy states are so far apart in energy, they are incredibly badass tumor-killing photons. That's, that's the idea. Now, another thing you can do, and this is kind of awesome, this is a, a, a radiograph of someone who's having being treated for prostate cancer. And, and in, into the prostate tumor, they have put these little seeds, the little metal seeds that contain tellurium-125, and it emits low energy x-rays and gamma rays. But they don't go very far. They're very, very low energy, so they'll travel a couple of millimeters. So they put these little seeds in, and those are the little green things that you see. I put the little seeds in, and they will damage tissue in their immediate area. And so the, t the seeds are planted specifically in the tumor. And so you get a massive dose to the tumor and very little dose to the healthy tissue. And the tellurium-125 has a very very short half-life and so by the time the tumor has shrunk and gone away the seeds have stopped being radioactive now you can also use radiation to diagnose diseases and one way you can do that is doing a so-called gamma scan and the primary way that this is done is using technetium technetium does not occur in nature it only occurs in situations where it's been created and hospitals get molybdenum-99 from um, nuclear medicine vendors and the molybdenum-99 decays with a half-life of 2.75 days into technetium-99 and technetium-99 decays it's an excited state of technetium and it decays with the emission of a gamma ray with a half-life of six hours so inside the back room at the hospital they got this molybdenum-99 cow and then they take it and they elute the technetium from it, which is always being produced. And they take that technetium and they form it into things that can be used to produce gamma scans. So here was a case where someone um, was given the technetium and it was the technetium atoms were connected to these sulfur colloid particles. And the person drank those. And then those are... Uh, that's something which is preferentially taken up by the kidneys and the bladder and then an image was made of where is the radiation in the person's body and it shows you where are those tissues where are the tissues that are taking up the radiation and this is a person having a bone scan done and it turns out the technetium if you just inject something with that radioactive technetium, it's taken up where the bone is growing, taken up in bones where bone is growing. Now, if you're a person of this age, your bones shouldn't be growing. If they are growing, it's either arthritis or it's a tumor. And in this case, this particular person, they're looking with this network of Geiger counters to see where the gamma rays are coming from. And they're coming from these particular spots, these hot spots. And what that says is there's a lot of technetium there that means there's a lot of bone growth. Well, there shouldn't be a lot of bone growth in a person of this age. So that tells you there's a tumor. And this person actually has spinal cancer. Actually, this is just a, a model. This is a stock photo. But, uh, but a person, um, this is an actual image from a real patient. And they were imaged in a similar way. Radiation from the tumors are coming into the gamma camera. And you can see those are the hot spots. Lots of isotope. Lots of isotope means there's a problem. And you're not imaging the structure of the tissue, you're imaging the function. That tells you, because on an x-ray this might look just fine. You see like, oh, there's the person's spine. But this says there's the person's spine, but it's growing. It's growing and that is not normal. There's either a break, there's arthritis, or there's a tumor. And this is a, a couple more gamma scans. Okay, And this is a place where a person had a, a fracture. And you can see this is a person's leg and there's there was a fracture there's bone growth which is happening here and this person had a couple of spinal fractures and you can image for them and you can use this to find things which won't show up on x-rays it's kind of a really really interesting way to go 
And that's the image that we started the class with, was this image of a person's hands. It's a gamma scan, and it's showing there's lots of arthritis in the hand. You're having a lot of growth that is uh, concentrating the isotope, and that is due to arthritis in this person's hand. You can also use something called single photon emission commuted tomography, and that's uh, uh, computed tomography, and that's kind of a, 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 a long expression, but here's what it means. You take the technetium, and you, you tag it to glucose. So you take the technetium, and remember it's the excited form of it, and you tag it to glucose. Now your brain takes up glucose, but it only takes up, because that's the only form of energy that your brain can use. So your brain takes up the glucose. When it uses the glucose, the technetium stays behind. So you give the person a drink consisting of glucose tagged with technetium, and then ask him to like solve a crossword puzzle. And you put them in and you do a gamma scan. And if the brain's normal, you see lots of activity in certain regions, less activity in other regions. But that is the image of a normal brain undergoing normal activity. If you're imaging here that says, here's a place in the person's brain where I'm not getting the same level of activity. The glucose is not being taken up. And it's showing this is the presence of Alzheimer's. Um, there's just spots in the brain that just are not active on a x-ray on an MRI, they might look the same, but they're not working the same. Their appearance is the same, but the function is not. Now, let's talk about positrons. I mean, why not? I think we know each other well enough that we can talk about positrons to each other. So let's do that. And positrons are anti-electrons. We talked about them briefly before. A positron is the antiparticle of an electron. So an electron is negatively charged. A positron is positively charged. It has the same mass, and but it, besides that, it's opposite on all the key properties, charge and lepton number and other kinds of things that you don't need to be aware of. But the thing is, if you take a positron and an electron and you bring them together, they completely annihilate to produce energy. But you can also produce them from energy. So in this case, here was a positron and electron pair that was made by a gamma ray that came in, struck a nucleus of an atom, produced a positron and electron, and that's something we talked about previously. So gamma ray comes in, kaboom, has a collision, makes a positron and an electron. The magnetic field in this picture is out of the board or out of the screen. So the magnetic field looks like this. That's my magnetic field. And my question is this. Which of these particles, A or B, is the electron? Which one is the positron? And then next, why do the circles get smaller? And you're looking at it and you're saying like, holy cow, Brian, you're asking me to remember magnetic field stuff. We did that stuff before spring break. That was before the time of social distancing. Yes, indeed, I know, but our exam is gonna stretch back to all of those topics. So I want you to remember, I want you to review, I want you to think about this. You have it in you to solve this problem. Don't jump ahead to the answer, you little scamp. Go ahead and review that material and answer this question. Which of these particles is the electron? Which is the positron? And why do the circles get smaller? Take a minute to think about it. I'll be back. Now before we jump ahead to the solution, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about right-hand rule. So the magnetic field is going out of the board. Okay, right-hand rule tells me magnetic field going out of the board, velocity going to the right, that the force on a positively charged particle would be downward. And if you look at the path of this particle, as it starts to move, it begins to curve downward. And so B is our positron, that's our E plus. If I look at the force on a negatively charged particle it's in the opposite direction, so the green trail represents a negatively charged particle because it begins to get pulled upward. That clearly is the electron. Why do the circles get smaller? Think about this. Remember when we talked about paths of charged particles in magnetic fields and the radius of the, they go in circles, and the radius of the orbit, remember, was proportional to the speed. As the particles slow down, the radius of the circle gets smaller. And so what's happening is the circles are getting smaller because the particles are losing energy, and we can tell they're losing energy because they're leaving a little ionized trail behind, and the energy to ionize the atoms has to come from someplace. It comes from the kinetic energy. And that's our solution sketched out in some detail. 
Now I want you to think about this. We're going to make nuclei that are neutron rich. We're going to make nuclei that are proton rich. And we do that by accelerating protons in this device called a cyclotron. And then the cyclotron, you take a proton and you accelerate it and you keep it going in a circle with a strong magnetic field and it goes fast and you keep accelerating it going faster and faster, it goes in bigger and bigger circles and then it comes out at a high speed and you can get the particles up to very, very high speeds. This is a picture of a cyclotron right here. So we speed the particles up, we set them round and round and round in each orbit, they get a kick, they get a really, really high speed, that's a cyclotron. You slam those protons into a nucleus of an atom and if you slam a proton into an oxygen 18, the proton knocks out a neutron. So a neutron pops out the other side. That's one, uh, one thing that can happen. So it's just like a billiard ball collision. Proton comes in, slams into the neutron, boom. Neutron is ejected, proton comes to rest, insinuated into the nucleus. And so I have a nucleus that has one fewer proton. I'm sorry, one more proton and one fewer neutron. And so instead of having oxygen 18, I have fluorine 18, I've increased the atomic number by one. And here's my question. If I make a nucleus this way, what is its most likely decay mode? Do not Google this. Do not look it up. Do not look at Appendix C to see what the decay mode of that nucleus is. Reason, based on what you know about physics, what is the likely decay mode of this nucleus? Take a minute to think about it. I'll be back. Well, of course, if you made the nucleus by sticking in an extra proton and taking away a neutron, this is a nucleus which is proton rich. And if a nucleus is proton rich, it's going to decay by beta minus a decay, I'm sorry, beta plus decay. And inside the nucleus, a proton turns into a neutron. And then it also emits a positron because it's got to get rid of that positive charge when the proton turns into a neutron and it comes out as a positron. So this is a beta plus emitter. It's a positron emitter. Those do not occur in nature, but you can make them. And why would you want to do such a crazy thing? Well, heavens to Betsy, we're going to talk about that right now. And here it is just written out for us in detail. You have beta plus dk. We took a, a nucleus, we removed a neutron, added a proton. That nucleus is proton rich. It's going to want a beta plus dk. So this is going to be decaying by emitting a positron. And it's the positron that we're interested in for medical reasons, as we'll talk about. But first, now there's a couple of different positron emitters that, that we use in medical techniques. And one of them is a couple of positron emitters that are used in medicine. One of them is fluorine 18, the other is oxygen 15. And for each of those, I want you to tell me what are the daughter nuclei. When a fluorine 18 decays, when an oxygen 15 decays, what does it decay into? Take a minute, don't look it up in the book, reason based on what you know about how nuclei work and come up with the answer. What are the daughter nuclei? Take a moment to reason about it. I'll be here when you get back. Well, if you're fluorine 18 and then you decay by emitting a positron, what that means is, and I've written it with numbers like this, a zero up at the top and a plus one down below. Zero is the atomic mass number. Well, an electron doesn't have any positrons or, or protons or neutrons, so it's got zero up there. The plus one down at the bottom, I can think of as being the number of protons, but I can also think of it as the number of charges. I lost a positive charge out of the nucleus, so as a consequence, I can only have eight positive charges in the remaining nucleus. But I didn't lose any nucleons, and so I still have 18 nucleons. And so I have 18 nucleons, eight protons. That's oxygen 18. Basically, the nucleus goes back to where it came from. And if I look at oxygen 15, oxygen 15 loses one positive charge. And so as a consequence, it's going to be atomic number seven. It does not lose any nucleons, and so it's atomic weight 15. And so I end up with nitrogen 15, which is a stable isotope of nitrogen. And here it is written out. These are the daughter nuclei for these two decays. Now let's talk about how you would use these in positron emission tomography. 
If you take a proton, or sorry, if you take an electron, E minus, and an E plus, they completely annihilate and they produce nothing but energy. And the energy is given off in the form of photons, but it always produces two photons going in opposite directions because photons have momentum, surprisingly enough. So to conserve momentum, those two things come together and they produce two photons that go in exactly opposite directions. So if you put the person, if you take a person who has ingested a positron emitting isotope and you put them inside a device to scan for it, you're making a PET scan, a PET scan, what you're gonna do is this. Inside the person's brain, a positron is emitted it combines with an electron, makes two gamma rays that go in opposite directions. And what you can do is you can see like, oh, where did I detect the gamma rays? I detected one here, I detected one here. You can actually measure the timing and you can decide where along this line the gamma ray was emitted. And so you can pinpoint with extreme accuracy exactly where the particle came from. And you can use this um, in, in PET scans. This is kind of a phenomenal thing. So for instance, if I take oxygen 15, very short half-life, ask a person to breathe in some oxygen, some um, air containing oxygen 15, it quickly goes to the person's brain if they're thinking. And you can tell where inside the brain the oxygen 15 is decaying. You can see where is the active part in the person's brain. You can also use it to image tumors. So here's a person who had a glucose tagged with fluorine 18. It's taken up by the brain. And then you can see here places where I'm getting more counts. More counts tells me more glucose has been taken up. That's a place where you have a tumor. These are some scans of person who has breathed oxygen 15 in air. And you can see where it's being used in the brain. So if you're playing a tape of a language and it's an unfamiliar language to a person, the parts of the brain that are active are places concerned with audition, with hearing. But if you play a familiar language, you get extra regions. And these are the parts of the brain that are connected with interpreting speech. And so you can see the parts of the brain that are just concerned with hearing and the parts that are concerned with actually interpretation of speech. So this is an interesting research tool. I want to stop here and I'm going to give a, 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 a basically a commercial. Next year in Physics 122, we will be back in the class. There will be no more social distancing. We will be working at tables with other human beings, which is absolutely the best way to learn physics. And when I do that, I will need other people to serve as learning assistants. And I want you to check the link on Canvas. And I want you to think about applying. Um, you. It would be awesome to have some of you back. I think that the, the class is this great community and part of how I build the community or how we build the community as a class is people who have been in the class one year come back the next year and help the next generation of people. And having that generational kind of like assistance from someone who has had the class before who was just last year sitting exactly where you are is really, really helpful. So it's part of my design that I have people who were in the class be the learning assistance for next year. So I'd love to see kind of some of you come back. Check out the link on Canvas. Go ahead and sign up. I'd love to have you back. Now, the next topic I want to look at is energy balance in the Earth system. And this is going to be an application of some things which we've talked about earlier in the course. To a first approximation, the temperature of the Earth doesn't change much with time. The Earth is about the same temperature as it was two billion years ago. So what that tells us is, to a pretty good approximation, the energy in is equal to the energy out. Now, the Earth warms by absorbing electromagnetic radiation. That's the only way energy gets in. It's because there's light from the sun that streams in, hits the surface of the Earth, gets absorbed. That's what warms the Earth. And let's do a quick calculation about that. The Earth cools by emitting. So the incoming energy is this. The power that the observe Earth absorbs from sunlight is the intensity of sunlight times the area that the light shines on times one minus the albedo. And the albedo is the amount of light that's reflected. And you can see we've got a lot of reflecty bits here. The cloudy bits and the snowy bits reflect a lot of energy back to space. The albedo of the Earth is about 0.367. The intensity of sunlight is one 
1,366 watts per square meter. This is the radius of the Earth. So if I'm going to do that calculation of the incoming energy, here's my question. What do I use for the area? I want you to think about what the area means in this case. Cogitate. Think about this. I'll be here when you get back. Well, if we just look at the Earth here, from the point of view of the sun, the Earth looks like a circle. This is the Earth from the point of view of the sun. It's a circle. And so the area of the circle is just pi r squared. And so the area is just pi times the radius of the Earth squared. It's not the whole surface of the Earth. It's just one side. And if you look at that one side, it looks like a disk. It looks like a circle. So the area is just pi r squared. That is the area that is capturing the sunlight. pi times the radius of the Earth squared. But the Earth warms by emitting electromagnetic radiation, also cools by emitting electromagnetic radiation. And so you can see the Earth is radiating energy out to space. This is a picture from a satellite of the Earth. And you can see there's hot spots here, and the hot spots are radiating lots of energy out to space. That's how the Earth cools, is by radiating electromagnetic radiation. Now we've seen relationships for that particular kind of electromagnetic radiation. So if we look at the outgoing energy, okay, the outgoing energy, as the Earth radiates energy out into space, the power of the outgoing energy is this. It's equal to E, the emissivity, times sigma, which is this universal constant right here, times the area, times the fourth power of the temperature. E, the emissivity, is 0.9. That's kind of an average over kind of the different things they're emitting. Here's a question for you. What is the area that we use in this relationship? What is the area? So take a minute to cogitate. Tell me what you use for the area. I'll be here when you get back. And if we look at this picture, the Earth this is the Earth radiating out into space. But it radiates from all parts and radiates from all parts uniformly. Only one side of the Earth sees the sun, but both sides of the Earth see the sky. And so the Earth is radiating out into space from all places. And so as a consequence, the area that we use is 4 pi times the radius of the Earth squared. It's the surface area of the Earth. So with this information in hand, we could actually compute a number for the uh, we can actually write down an expression for the outgoing energy. We also have an expression for the incoming energy. And we know that there's an energy balance in the Earth's system. Now, I want to think about this. We said that the energy in is equal to the energy out. And if you look at the two calculations that we just wrote out, we know that the energy in is equal to the energy out. Now, if that's true, we can equate the power in, and actually we can just calculate that. that that's a, that, a couple slides ago. We can set that equal to the expression which we previously wrote down on the previous slide, which is a collection of constants times t to the fourth, and you calculate the temperature of the surface of the Earth as zero degrees Fahrenheit. Well, we know that that's not true. If the temperature was 0 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 18 degrees Celsius, the Earth would be a frozen ice ball. There would be no life on Earth. We wouldn't be having this discussion. So there has to be something wrong in our calculation. And in fact, there is. There is a complicating element to the whole system. And it's this. There is extra energy that is striking the surface of the Earth. The calculation that we did was for the surface of the Earth. Now, the Earth gets energy from the sun. We know that that's true. But it also gets energy from the sky. If you look at the blue sky above you, it is actually shining thermal energy down on you. And the extra energy to make the Earth warmer actually comes from the sky. It's sky shine. And over the course of the Earth day, the surface of the Earth receives more energy in the form of thermal radiation from the sky than it receives in the form of light from the sun. Sky shine is more important than sunshine in terms of keeping the Earth warm, which is crazy to think about, but it's absolutely true. And the reason it's true is this. This is the greenhouse effect. In the atmosphere, there are gases that absorb thermal radiation that the Earth is emitting, and they re-radiate it downward. And so they get that extra sky shine. And with 
those gases in the atmosphere, we get a temperature that's 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius, much more reasonable. That's the average temperature on the surface of the Earth. That is the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is a good thing. This is good. Without the greenhouse effect, there would be no life on Earth. But here's the problem. We are in a situation where we are rapidly getting too much of a good thing. A certain degree of warming is great. Too much warming is not great. Now let's talk about how greenhouse gases work and then let's think about um, what, what the problems are and how we can fix them. So here's the thing. Electromagnetic waves are produced when I have oscillating charges. Oscillating charges emit waves of electric fields and magnetic fields. And certain gases will emit electromagnetic waves and certain ones won't. So for instance, nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen and oxygen, they equally share the charges between them. There are no charges on the oxygen and the nitrogen. And so there's nothing for electric fields to grab a hold of. Carbon dioxide, so I've got my oxygen atoms here, I've got my C atom here, the carbon is positive, the oxygens are negative. And so as a consequence, you can hit that with an electric field. If I hit it with an electric field that's directed this way, the carbon atom moves up, the oxygen atoms move down, and I get the atom will flex. And so carbon dioxide will absorb electromagnetic waves, and it will also emit electromagnetic waves even stronger effect from water, because water's got a dipole moment. When electromagnetic waves hit it, it rotates. And when it's rotating, it will also emit electromagnetic waves. So microwave ovens use this principle. Water is a very, very strong greenhouse gas. It will absorb, it will absorb electromagnetic waves. I want you to take a look at this video, and there's this key concept video about greenhouse gases, and it let, it let us see them. And we're going to talk about particularly those two gases, the carbon dioxide and the water vapor. So pause, take a look at that video, and then come back. And there's another video that's going to be posted, and this is a video uh, that was taken on campus, and it was looking at the output from this plant on CSU's campus that you produces electricity, but also hot water to heat the buildings, and it puts out a lot of greenhouse gases. And you can see the greenhouse gases coming up the stack because it's the water vapor and the carbon dioxide. So it shows that and other things. So take a look at those two videos, and that will help make the reality of the greenhouse gases more apparent. Now here's the thing. We are putting extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, because we're burning fossil fuels. And as a consequence, we are changing the radiation balance of the atmosphere. And this is not a subject of modeling. This is not a subject of theory. This is absolutely true. If you look at the radiation emitted by the Earth, one of the terms in that equation was the emissivity. We as a species are actually changing the emissivity of the atmosphere. We have made measurable changes in the radiative properties of the Earth. We have changed that constant, okay? And so we as a species are altering the fundamental dynamics of energy exchange in the Earth's atmosphere, and it is measurable. This is not a subject of debate. This is not a subject of theory. This is not a subject of models. This is happening, and this is one of the clearest indications of that. Now, I wanna look at the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And they typically bounce around between 200 parts per million and 300 parts per million. So here's historical data from this Vostok iron, core, iron ice core. It goes back to like half a million years ago. And you can see the carbon dioxide is kind of like going up and down. And when it's high, it's warm. And when it's low, it's cool. And so there's like warm periods and there's cool periods. Check out the spike. And I have it here at 400, but actually now we're over 400. We're up like here. And so it's rising and it's rising fast. That level of um, change in a, that short period of time is unprecedented. And you can see that by looking at the data, there's fluctuations, but nothing like the fluctuation that we're seeing in the present. Now, here's a question. You could say um, that 
maybe the carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere, but maybe that wasn't us who did it. Well, there's a couple of lines of argument that shows that in fact it is us. And I'm gonna show you what those are and have to do with isotopes. So first off, I wanna think about this. About 1.1% of the carbon in the Earth's system is carbon-13. That's it's a stable isotope, it's a heavier isotope of carbon. But in plants, the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 is slightly less than 1.1%. There's less carbon-13 in plants than there is in the atmosphere, relatively. And why would that be so? And I want you to think about how gases get into plants, and they get into plants through these stomata, okay, through little openings. Why would you have less carbon-13? I want you to just cogitate about that. And ultimately, it comes down to this. It's diffusion. It's diffusion. It, heavier molecules diffuse more slowly, and so it takes more time for the carbon-13 to get in. As a consequence, plants are enriched in carbon-12, and they are deficient in carbon-13. Now I want you to take a look at this graph, okay? This graph right here shows the difference in the carbon-13 in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you can see over time, the relative amount of carbon-13 in the atmosphere is decreasing, it is steadily decreasing. There's a seasonal variation that has to do with like plants doing their thing. That's at Mauna Loa. Same thing is true at the South Pole. The amount of carbon-13 is decreasing. So what that means is the extra CO2 that is put in the atmosphere is deficient in carbon-13. It's deficient in carbon-13. What that tells us is the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere came from plants. So does that mean we blame the plants for the additional greenhouse warming? Not so fast. There's another isotope we need to consider, and that's carbon-14. Now here is kind of like the baseline level of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Okay, And as you look over time, since basically the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon-14 in the, in the atmosphere has decreased rapidly. So what that says is the extra carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere is deficient in carbon-14. It's deficient in carbon-14. By the way, you'll see my graph stopped in the 1950s because if you look at it subsequently, the amount of carbon-14 spikes because of the above-ground nuclear testing. But if we look at the data before that, there was definitely a decrease in the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So what that means is the carbon-14 in the atmosphere came from plants, but it came from long buried plants. So the extra carbon in the atmosphere, it came from plant sources, but plant sources that had been buried, plant sources that had been buried a long time, i.e., it came from fossil fuels. The extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere came from burning oil, gas, and coal. Absolutely, there's no question about that. The extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is there because we put it there. And the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is producing effect. Now I want to do a quick summary of, of, of what we know at this point. So CO2 is a key determinant of the Earth's climate. Okay, the Earth is warmer than it would be otherwise because of thermal radiation from the sky, and that is from greenhouse gases, and CO2 is one of the greenhouse gases. CO2 levels are increasing. The CO2 is increasing due to human activity. It's increasing because we put it there, and it is also true that the climate is changing. And these are measurable. These are all things that we are seeing happen in the world. And there is no doubt, there's no debate about these facts right here. There's debate about the details. There's detail, there's data about uh, debate about kind of the, 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 the exact details of some of these things, but the broad picture is clear. There's no deb debate about this. And the climate changing is something you're seeing, and rather than thinking about warming, which is something that will happen, I would prefer to think about global weirding. And just think about the weather that we've had, and, and it's been unusual. We've had more extreme storms, we've had floods, we've had droughts, we've had fires. This is changing climate. This is changing climate. And you are seeing it happen. And you've seen 100-year storms becoming 10-year storms. 
Once in a lifetime events are happening more often, and that's this global weirding. And this is the key signature of climate change. This is the first thing you will see. And it's a big deal. This is already displacing people. It's already kind of like making it harder to grow crops in certain places. This, this is bad. This is going to produce terrible effects in the future. And here's the tricky thing about it, okay? The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing because of burning fossil fuels. And everybody in the planet is part of putting additional carbon in the atmosphere. It's fossil fuels, it's also changes in land use. There's all kinds of things which are happening. But we are all responsible for doing this. As Pogo said in this poster from the first Earth Day, we have met the enemy and he is us. Things are happening and we are all responsible for making this happen. But I find hope. In this situation, I am still able to find hope. And the reason I can find hope well, there's a few of them. One of them is this. We know what's causing climate change and we know how to stop it. We know how to stop it. The technologies to stop it already exist and progress is being made. This is not an intractable problem. It's a hard problem, but it's one we know how to solve it. We know what needs to be done. And you know this, your generation is acutely aware of this. And the people of the planet are aware of this. There was this Paris Climate Accord that was a consensus agreement of 195 countries that this is a big deal and this is something that we need to do something about, okay? That was a huge deal. And the fact that you would get representatives of 195 countries coming together and signing one agreement is like, wow, that had not happened previously about anything in my lifetime. But I would encourage you to pay attention because if you think about the current situation, okay, things are not going and always going in the direction I would like to see them go in. So I would encourage you heartily to pay attention. But I want to close with this message of hope. And ultimately, how do I take hope in dark times when we have difficult times, like when we're experiencing pandemics and we're doing this social distancing, when the climate is changing, when it looks like things are dark, how do I find hope? I find hope because of the students that I teach. You folks are amazing. You are bright, you are creative, you are motivated, you're good people. And I had no doubt that whatever problems the universe throws at us, you folks will be able to handle it. You folks will be able to handle it. And honestly, I sleep much better at night thinking about you folks. So I would encourage you to, to, to use your energies, use your talents to make the world a better place. And so many of you I've talked to want to do that. And that gives me hope. And in the middle of this difficult time, I want you to know just sitting here thinking about you folks and what amazing people you are. I have no doubt that this situation that we, we are in will end and it will end well. And it will teach you valuable lessons about how to make the world an even better place in the future. Things are going to be fine and they're going to be fine because the people who are calling the shots in the future are not me and my generation. The people who are calling the shots in the future are you and your generation. And I can't think of any group of people I would rather see in charge of how things go. I have a lot of hope because I have a lot of faith in the young people that I know. And I'm tearing up. So I'm going to go ahead and, and finish up the lecture for today. And next time we're going to do a bit more review. Thanks very much.